Hello, everybody. My name is Amanda James, and I'm the Executive Director of the Georgia Gerontology Society. Thank you for joining us. I know that we've had so many webinars, um, and if you're like me, you may feel a little webinared out, thus my beach background of where I wish I was, but I am really excited about the topic today, and I appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Today, we are going to be watching a series of videos um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about those videos in a minute, but I wanted to first talk a bit about the series as a whole. We're going to be watching some videos with some content in between today and next Wednesday. The following Wednesday, we'll have a Dementia Friends information session, and then the last Wednesday, we will be discussing dementia-friendly communities and kind of pulling in everything that we've learned thus far. So you're welcome to attend one or all. The lived experience panel next Wednesday will be different from today. So if you only signed up for today's thinking that they were the same and it was a repeat, they will be different. But first, let me just give a little bit of context for this project. Um, this is sort of a, a happy accident in a lot of ways. We had a contract with the Georgia Department of Human Services to do some events throughout the state to talk about dementia-friendly communities and to do dementia-friendly information sessions. And then, like all of you, we were hit with COVID and had to adjust what we were doing. And so we had the idea to do some virtual events and because um, we could reach more people and, and not have to do as much travel, we thought this would be a wonderful opportunity to invite individuals that were living with a form of cognitive impairment and their care partners to share their experience, something that's very important to us at the Georgia Gerontology Society, as well as our partners who worked on this video, is to hear from individuals themselves and what are their experiences and what are their challenges and what can they share with us instead of us talking about what they need. So we invited um, various individuals. Some were able to participate and some were not. We ended up with six care dyads. We have a couple that are living with mild cognitive impairment, one that has Parkinson's with dementia-like symptoms. And as you'll hear in a video, hasn't formally been diagnosed with dementia, but um, acknowledges the symptoms. We also have um, two frontotemporal dementia and one Lewy body and one Alzheimer's. It was important to us to try to get a range. Um, another point that's very important to us here is that dementia is more than just Alzheimer's, although that might be the most prevalent kind. We want to recognize the variants and experiences, and so we tried to get a variety of groups. Um, I do want to acknowledge a few challenges that we experienced. Um, obviously, because of COVID, we had to do these virtually so as not to put anyone at risk. And while we did do our best, there may be some sound issues um, or some, you know, internet cutting in and out things. Um, we, we tried to minimize that in the editing of the videos, but I don't want that to distract from what folks are actually saying. And of course, because we shifted gears in the hopes that things would be better by the fall, um, we did experience a bit of a time crunch issue. And so while we're really proud of the, the videos, um, we did kind of both record and edit these kind of quickly. And, and that doesn't detract at all from the importance of what folks are saying, but we just wanna kind of admit that up front in case you notice anything that might distract you. And with that, I'm going to again acknowledge the Georgia Department of Human Services. Um, their funding made this project possible. And then I'm going to turn it over to GGS board member Victoria Helmley, who's going to set the stage a little bit and just tell us a bit about dementia and the different types. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm really excited about this project because, as Amanda said, we actually we get to hear from people living with dementia and their care partners. And so I'm really excited for all of you to see the videos because they will explain it much better than I can in any of these slides. Um, and I know that this is a review for many, most, maybe most people on the on this um, webinar, the basics of dementia. But we did want to start with this so that we could um, just make sure we're all in the same place before we hear the videos. So um, when we talk about dementia, um, we usually 
uh, you may have heard this, an umbrella term. So it's referring to uh, many different diseases that cause dementia. Um, as Amanda mentioned, you probably hear Alzheimer's the most, um, but there are so many other types, and that's why it was important for us to have that representation on, um, on this webinar. And you'll notice from the videos the range of signs and symptoms that, um, that these folks experienced. Um, so some of the types, as she mentioned, uh, dementia with Lewy bodies, frontotemporal, Alzheimer's. Um, one that's not in the videos, but that you probably hear about is vascular dementia. Um, and that, that umbrella term, that umbrella, um, sorry, image can just help us visualize all of those things fall under that um, term dementia. Um, but we're referring to diseases that cause uh, memory loss, they can, it can cause personality changes, it can cause um, just trouble with planning and thinking. Um, you'll see in the videos hallucinations. Um, and we also want to point out that dementia is not a normal part of aging. And so you may um, hear that, that someone has, is experiencing dementia and that's just them getting older, and it's not a normal part of uh, aging. It is um, a sign of a disease. Um, we also want to point out with that that age is a risk factor. So as one ages, the risk for um, dementia increases. However, there are many younger people who experience these diseases, and um, there is a range of ages. And you'll notice in our videos that we have people that are, um, that are younger or younger when they were diagnosed. And we can go on to the first video. Thank you, Victoria. Um, the first video we're wa going to watch is our care dyads discussing the first signs and symptoms that they noticed. It was kind of hard coming on um, for me. I didn't understand what was happening. Um, I, Rick would tell me that I had left something someplace and I thought he was wrong. I was not there. I didn't, you know, be, it could be like something on the coffee table or whatever, you know, little things like that. Um, yeah, there was not any big items, but just a lot of forgetfulness and, and things along that line. One of the things that I recall very vividly was uh, us sitting across the table from each other and Sandy told me, she says, I am not doing these things. I'm not uh, pushing your buttons. I really don't remember or I forgot or or whatever. That was startling to me at the time. But that was that was my first imprint uh, uh, of her being sincere about not remembering and forgetting things. We were driving in the car. Uh, Rick was driving and we were in the car together. And um, I started talking and I was ended up going blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and it was just about like that um, I could not get a word out and that was one of the things that really um, bothered me at the time and I laughed about it but it's still I wonder what in the world happened it was very strange what I noticed is um, he he has a PhD in business and he was already always very frugal with money. He was the investor in the house and all of that started to change where he was spending money on things like pictures that really didn't make a lot of sense. Um, he began to see people that no one else would see he began to eat things that he typically would not eat. So that started to bring a lot of different little signals to me that there was a change somewhere going there, going on with him, but not really sure exactly what that change meant. Well, I kept telling Sharon there for, I don't know, one or two summers or you know that I felt off. I didn't feel right. It, it. I could tell it wasn't physical. It was just my brain wasn't functioning correctly. 
And I just couldn't put my foot. She kept asking me, well, what do you mean? I don't know. I just know that something is off, but I can't tell you what. The first thing that I noticed was the apathy. Uh, he stopped mowing the lawn and doing things outside. So that was the first thing I noticed was the apathy. In 2003, I had a heart attack and open heart surgery. Uh, I was put in a coma, uh, control coma for a few days. And then when I came out and when I came home, uh, I didn't feel the same. And even after I recovered from my surgery and went to rehab and all these things, it seemed like my mind was not as sharp as it once had been. And I started acting. Now I'm told this, uh, I would start acting out and doing things that wasn't the way I normally acted. And my family brought it to my attention. And then over time, we went to the doctor and then they started testing me. And it took about six months his behavior changed so radically that I really thought I was going to have to get a divorce. He would act up so later in the day, primarily, and I would just be in tears and it was horrible. And the next morning, I would just be so sad and upset and asking him what's the matter. He had no memory of anything. And I really believed he had no memory of anything. The earliest symptoms that I can recall were that I was becoming forgetful. And um, that was a little bit confusing to me because I've never been that way that I can recall. Um, and so it, we were prompted to have an evaluation. And so we made arrangements to get that done. And I noticed some similar things with him. Um, couldn't remember where things were sometimes, or we'd go to the grocery store with the list and leave off a couple of things that were on the list. Um, would forget maybe when he had an appointment or we were supposed to go somewhere. So those were kind of early signs. So those last slides at the end are in all of our videos. Um, for time purposes, I'm, I'm going to move on in our subsequent videos from those slides, but I did just want to point out that those are there. Um, we have the names of our participants and we also have a slide that we recognize that this is just a few experiences, that there are a lot of other ones and that we, something that is often said at trainings I attend is if you've met one person with dementia, you've met one person with dementia. So while we, we hope that there is information that will be helpful to people in these videos, we again want to emphasize that we are in no way saying that this is everyone's experience or that these are the only experiences. So, oh, sorry, Victoria. <laughs> um, did you want to do this, Victoria? No, go ahead. OK, so um, as pointed out in the video, there, there are several different warning signs. A lot of people assume that um, short-term memory changes is, is the only sign. Um, and, and that's just not the case. Um, there are several different ones that people may experience. And this can cause problems with people not going to get a diagnosis or not knowing what was wrong because they just hear about memory loss. But these are just some others that people might experience. And the um, website that includes more information is at the bottom. Difficulty finding the right words, changes in mood, apathy. I think this is one that people rarely hear about, but is something, um, especially with folks with FTD, that can be a symptom. 
difficulty completing normal tasks, confusion, difficulty following storylines, a failing sense of direction, being repetitive, and not just with words, but also being repetitive with actions. So perhaps um, someone brushes their teeth and then they brush their teeth again because they don't realize that they have done that or struggling to adapt to change. Um, people's personalities don't typically change overnight. And so if there's changes in mood or personalities or people are just different than they used to be, then that's definitely something that you should get checked out. And our next video is going to talk a bit about um, the diagnosis journey of our care dyads, and then we'll talk a little bit more about that process after the video. I was uh, diagnosed uh, way a long time ago. Uh, was, our family doctor wanted me to go see our, our doctor, and, and we, I mean, a, a neurologist. neurologist, which I did. And uh, after a brief diagnosis, he, uh, he said, I think you've got something like Michael J. Fox, which has floored me. And, uh, but anyway, we went from there, and I, I, didn't, I really didn't think much about it or have any results as a, as a result of Parkinson's for several years. Our, our neurologist has been hesitant to, um, to zero in on the dementia, even though she is um, watching it. She also did one of the quick um, cognitive assessments, which he struggled with. But so far, um, none of his doctors have committed to any formal dementia diagnosis, even though they acknowledge it's there. We started with our primary doctor and of course was diagnosed with having some form of um, that he was depressed and I worked in the medical field and the press depression was not what I was seeing and I continue to stress that depression was not what I was seeing with him um, and then we had tests done, we had spinal taps. There were so many different tests that were painful for him that at a point I said, that's enough. We, we've done enough. We need to find someone that can look a little further because it's not depression. And that led us to being able to see someone that dealt with uh, neurology and to have a full uh, whole day with a, a psychoneurologist to help pinpoint really what was going on with us. That took about a year and probably would have taken longer if I had not been so persistent that we're not doing any other tests other than, you know, to find out what is really going on with his brain because I felt there was something else with his brain and it wasn't the fact that he was depressed. Well, the first steps, of course, uh, like everybody else, midnight crisis, we got to go to a marriage counselor. Um, Sharon could see that I was trying. And that was the first thing that we actually tried until Sharon saw a video and she realized that I was doing the, having the same symptoms that uh, my mother had, uh, who passed away of uh, Pick's disease is what they used to call FTD. Yeah, but, uh, when, I, when I saw it is what it is that the AFTD produced quite, quite by accident, uh, that's when I really put it together that, oh my goodness, Rod has what his mother had because we were never informed of her having any behavioral issues until after Rod was diagnosed. And so we weren't, I wasn't looking for that. They always said, oh, it's like Alzheimer's and I didn't see any of that. So I just had no idea. It, it, they say it takes four years to get a correct diagnosis um, or up to four years. And so she decided that we were not going to start with uh, my regular PCP at that time. We were going to go direct 
to Emory Healthcare, that's where then she called and they gave her an appointment uh, six to eight months out. And that just wasn't going to work, but that's all she could do until uh, we went away for Thanksgiving and, and uh, one year when we came back. Uh, she was on the phone because I'd had a tremendous meltdown. It was uh, when I called and they said seven months, I was like, Ugh! so when we got back from this big incident over Thanksgiving, <clears throat> I called and said, he's going to lose his, because he was still working. I said, he's going to lose his job. I don't know what to do. Please refer us to someone that has knowledge of FTD so we can perhaps get a diagnosis because that's what I think it is because that's what his mother had. Part of it is that because Rod's mother had Pick's disease, which is now behavioral ovarian FTD, uh, because she had that, Rod has always had an awareness after he was diagnosed that he has FTD. That can be very different for a majority of people. Uh, most people have a nosognosio that means that they have no idea anything is wrong with them, <clears throat> which is why it's so hard to get a diagnosis because they say they they just say there's nothing wrong with me, it's you. So we were fortunate in that, and that when I said, Rod, I think you have what your mother had, he was willing to go for the testing and he was willing to get the diagnosis and he understood what it meant. So his actions were not as extreme as some people. If someone is not who they were, you should always think neurological before you consider psychological because people don't change overnight. And it was such a drastic change in his personality that it was hard to understand what was going on. So no one understands that when someone is that different, they should eliminate a neurological disorder before they go the counseling route. And uh, so that I think would save a lot of people a lot of time. It, is always a clinical diagnosis because there are no biomarkers for FTD. So it's always clinical and that's why it's so important to go to someone that knows FTD because so many people are misdiagnosed many, many times before they get an actual diagnosis, which is why it takes about four years to figure it out. My family brought it to my attention and then over time, we went to the doctor and then they started testing me and it took about six months before I got a complete diagnosis of, that I truly had with the body dementia. It did take a while for us to convince him to go to the doctor because I think no one wants to really admit that there, there's something wrong, but I think my, really, I was serious. I was going to leave him. And I think he said, no, no, I will go to the doctor. So we found a fabulous um, neurologist and it did take six months of a lot of extensive, extensive testing, primarily ruling out things. Since he had had the heart attack, you know, you, you rule out, was it something carotid, that sort of thing, even Lyme's disease. So it, it took a while. I think the first was um, talking to my doctor, my PCP. Um, he was absolutely wonderful. I uh, adored him and really uh, liked him a lot. He helped me through a lot of hard times. But when I tried to tell him about some strange things that was happening, he just kind of said, everybody does that. And um, he didn't listen to me. I mean, he was not ignoring me. He's a wonderful, wonderful doctor. Um, but I didn't, I just couldn't see what, uh, it, I don't know. It just didn't make a lot of sense sometimes. It was probably a couple more times, maybe the next time that he gave the, the simple uh, testing of holding up the pen and what is pen point and so forth and asking or made, maybe three things and asking her to recall those. Uh, but even that might have been the second or third time and, until finally he did uh, uh, 
uh, refer her to a neurologist. So it, it took some time. It was probably a year, maybe even a year and a half. I would say more like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as we heard from those videos of those experiences, um, it can be a challenge for people to get a, a diagnosis. And even from um, that initial um, screening, it can take a lot of time before they receive an accurate diagnosis. And that's why it's so important for us to be educated and talk about this. Um, ideally, someone would want um, a neurologist to do the formal diagnosis. But you, as you heard in the videos, many people talk with their primary care doctors first. Um, and as we heard, that can be a challenge if that primary care doctor does not fully understand um, the range of dementia symptoms and is, and is more hesitant to make that referral. Um, but most experts, and you've probably heard on, on many um, webinars and other things that early detection is very important because we want people to get diagnosed as early as possible so that education and support can be in place because waiting until a crisis can be really harmful to a family. Um, I also, you know, when I watch these videos, when I heard these experiences, the advocacy that comes from that person living with dementia and their care partner is very important um, when it comes to getting that initial diagnosis. You know, going back to that doctor and asking them to check again um, and asking them to um, consider other things. Um, so during a diagnosis, what that can look like, you heard um, people talk about um, blood tests, um, scans, um, and a lot of, you're probably familiar with a lot of the um, cognitive tests and tools that are used sometimes by primary care doctors and also by neurologists to make that initial diagnosis. And Amanda, you can go to the next slide. I just wanted to show, um, many of you may have seen this, it's called the MOCA, um, but this is one of the many tools that are used. Um, this one's a little bit more lengthy than some of them, but um, the clock drawing I think is probably the one that people most often recognize, um, asking someone to draw a certain time on a clock. Um, and I just wanted to show that as an example of a, a tool that physicians use to make that diagnosis. And I know for, um, for some people, that's the first step. And then um, going to the blood work. Um, I know that Kenneth and uh, Malcolm mentioned um, a lot of the things were painful and he went through a lot to get that initial diagnosis, which is why it's so important for us to talk about that. And you can go on. So in Georgia, um, we do want to, you know, point out that we have this resource that's that's unique. Um, the Georgia Department of Human Services funded, along with a partnership with Emory University, Georgia Memory Net. And um, the goal of Georgia Memory Net is that early detection and diagnosis of dementia and an accurate diagnosis. Um, and so we know, we heard from, um, from Rod's experience that um, some people wait many months to actually see a neurologist. And the goal of Georgia Memory Net is to cut that time um, to be much shorter for someone to go to their primary care physician and um, talk about the symptoms with them. And then that primary care physician make a referral over to a memory assessment clinic that's closest to that person. And so um, this is just a, a great resource that I think that um, we should all know as people in Georgia that we have this in our state. Um, you can go to the next one. Um, and here's the locations of those um, memory assessment clinics, or you'll probably hear them called MACs. Um, one of the, um, I guess, one of the most helpful parts of these MACs is that after that diagnosis is made, the person isn't just um, sent home with nothing. Um, the goal is that that person receives education, resources, and they're connected to um, local resources, something in their area, whether it's um, support groups, um, connecting them with their area agency on aging, uh, making sure that that person feels supported. And the other important part is that the Georgia Memory Net will send a care plan over to that primary care physician that initially referred them so that the care can continue and that primary care physician now has education on what's going on with that patient. Um, because as we saw in the videos, many um, primary care physicians um, are not aware of the um, 
all of the signs and symptoms that come about when someone has um, any type of dementia. And so um, we wanted to make sure that we pointed that out. Also, you'll see on the bottom of the screen, that's the website you can go to to learn more about Georgia Memory Net and, um, and this project. Thank you, Victoria. Um, we're now going to watch our next video, which is going to discuss some of the challenges that our care dyads experience as part of their um, dementia. We used to do a lot of visiting every year. We would go back and forth between our families. I would be the host one year and somebody else would be the next and so forth. Um, we have stopped. I stopped doing that about a year ago, I guess. Yeah. Um, I knew that I was reaching a point that I couldn't. I may take longer to process information in order to make a decision or to determine which direction I'm going to go um, and or what subject matter I'm going to bring up with Margaret about what we need to talk about. So uh, that's been the, the one thing that uh, uh, I have seen occur. And sometimes he needs prompting to get him started on a particular task, um, which is very different uh, from before. Uh, knowing where things are in the house has become a challenge because he'll forget, for instance, the dishes, he may forget, oh, the glasses are in that cabinet, but the plates are in the other cabinet. So I see that that has prog progressed. I see that happening where he may open a couple of cabinets to get to what he wants. I find myself sometimes getting too, too much in a hurry. And then, then I start like, uh, not not being able to to to, uh, to stay stay with it. In other words, uh, the uh, for, for forgetfulness is is there. Uh, but then I under, I've talked to others and read stories of others who seem to be much worse than I am. You know, when it comes to this area, the whole family has had to join in with a checklist of do you have all those things? Because the more emotional Steve gets, the more his dementia like qualities are pronounced. Early on, he enjoyed walking a lot. Matter of fact, he would walk faster than me. So I would be running to keep up with him. He, he, he loved to walk. Uh, he loved children. And now he basically wants to either watch TV or hear music playing. Um, he now don't want to get involved in activities uh, like the coloring. That's something that I kind of have him focused on doing that rather than just sit all day. Let's see. We used to be very, very, and I'm going to say used to because that's the way our life is used to be very, very involved in the community, in uh, kids' sports, in church. We taught Sunday school. We went on mission trips. We just did it all. Our house was open to one and all. And, um, you know, gradually over these years, that has disappeared. That's one of the things I regret as my condition goes on. I, I can't uh, go to like my granddaughter's volleyball game, softball games, and things like that, which with my two boys, I always attended everything they ever did. But I, I regret that I can't do that now with my granddaughters. But from a day-to-day -day basis, I have a routine set up that Kathy and I have uh, developed, I guess you'd say, that uh, I work out pretty good, but that wasn't always the case. It took a while to get to where I could deal with day-to-day -day life like I do now. I quit my job. I, this is something that needs to be brought up to the world. This hurts one 
very much financially. Well, the challenge is, of course, is the dementia itself and that I don't know. I may be perfectly fine when I get up. Well, I seem that I'm fine. And then all of a sudden I might start seeing colors. I might hallucinate about something running around the wall. Uh, all those things uh, happen to me at times. And I see little men with sharp pointy teeth runs at me sometimes. And, you know, and it's very real when it happens. But then when I get away from that, so to speak, then I realize that it's my mind working on me and it's not real. But at the time, it's always very real. Now he does not want to go anywhere because he never knows when those hallucinations are going to hit. He never knows when his behavior might act out. And he does not want people out in the world to know that or see that or react to that. It's scary at times. And uh, I get frustrated at times because uh, of the way things happen in my mind. Because for no reason at all, I might be uh, watching television and I call it my head going hollow. It's like there's no reason, nothing in my head. I can't think. I am just there. My head, I call it going electric. It's like if you can imagine looking in a kaleidoscope and just seeing colors of all dimensions swirling around, that's the way my head does. And just the uncertainty of uh, the way things happen is the most frustrating thing to me because I just don't know from day to day what I may encounter. We've really, really, really had to adjust our entire lifestyle to get to the point where we are now and acceptance of what it is. In this situation, because we can't go places with people, we're not in their world. You know, we can't go camping. We don't go out to restaurants. We don't do all the things that people of our age do. And there we are. But there we are. I mean, we're basically alone unless someone comes to see us. The reason I can't do that is because of emotional overload, I call it. Noise, as Kathy said earlier, bothers me. Uh, rapid movements and people running around and doing this, that, and the other bother me. And so I can't deal with things like I once did. I have no sympathy, no empathy, no social graces. Um, I've gotten myself you know, in trouble a couple of times saying things or, or from not caring. And that's one of the, I guess one of the things that is deep is we don't care what we say or what we do sometimes. The filter is gone. So it's, uh, it can be difficult in social situations when you don't have a filter and he can't stop it. Uh, no one can stop it. Sometimes when he loses his temper, he'll say, I know it's coming, but I can't stop it. I can't drive. Um, I no longer have a driver's license. Um, I go from day to day. Some days all I want to do is sit and read um, other days, I don't want to do anything but maybe watch a little TV or sleep, and it's really affected my sleep. I don't sleep that well at night some nights, but I'll sleep all day. Sharon can tell you that I used to read uh, books, and you could ask me years later about the book, and I could tell you almost word for word the storyline. Uh, now, I'll read a book. Next week, I'll pick it up and I'll look at it. I won't know if I read that book or not. So it's my short-term memory is tending to go uh, flaky, uh, but yeah, I've still got my long-term memory.
So for Rod, he's sort of mid. We're having some word issues, some understanding issues. There are good days and bad days. As you see progression, it uh, it changes. You know, the, the disease changes as we go along. There's no um, uh, intimacy, unfortunately. Um, you know, do we sleep in separate beds mainly because I popped her in the head a couple of times thrashing during the night. Rod has an issue in crowds and uh, there's a lot of anxiety when there's a crowd. So some of the activities that we used to do are not able to be done any longer because of there being a crowd. People with frontotemporal dementia especially do not look look like they have dementia, whatever that is. And they don't, and people don't feel as though they act like they have dementia. So there's a stigma about what dementia is in communities. And if people would just be more aware and know what dementia means and that it is a, a disease, it's, it isn't the person wanting to be a, a jerk. They're, they just have a disease and that disease takes over sometimes. FTD, because of the age of onset, uh, the normal age of onset is usually between 45 and 65, but as I said, some can be much younger and have small children at home. The cost of FTD is twice that of Alzheimer's. Uh, the studies show that Alzheimer's can cost a family up to $60,000 a year. Uh, FTD is 120,000 a year. And the reason for that is people lose their jobs in the prime your earning years. So if you're 50 years old, you're in the prime of your career and you now have to stop working or they fire you, which is usually what happens. And uh, you lose all your benefits and everything. So it's a very costly, dementia is a very costly disease. there's a couple things I want to point out from that video. One is I want to reassure everyone that not all of our videos are about negative things. Next Wednesday, we're going to talk about how our care dyads maintain a good quality of life, the importance of the support that's in their life, um, and some other things like that. Um, this week is a little bit more about kind of understanding the dementia itself. But I did just want to say, for those of you who may go, gosh, everything's been somewhat negative. That's not all that we talked about with our care dyads. Um, but the other thing I want to point out from this particular video is that for folks who don't work with individuals who have a form of cognitive impairment or dementia, they, they really probably only think about, again, the lack of memory and memory problems. And so as you heard, there are a variety of different things that these individuals are dealing with. And if you're not familiar and have a general overview of some of these items, then you're not necessarily going to recognize that if somebody is, as they put it, acting out in public, that it might not be, you know, that they're trying to be a jerk, as Sharon said, that they are actually dealing with something or that, you know, if somebody is having hallucinations, that it might not be some kind of psychotic break or, or something, of, you know, that it, it's based off their diagnosis. And, and there's a lot of different things that people need to recognize can come along with one of these forms of dementia that we, the general public may not know. Um, in addition, we want to focus a bit on some of resources. Obviously, in a one-hour call, we can't get too deep into these things. But for anybody who's on the phone who may have a loved one that's living with a dementia diagnosis and they're trying to find out how they can get some resources to help deal with some of these challenges, we wanted to share some resources for you. This first slide is different associations based on the different types. Obviously, if you don't know what type you have, you could still reach out to these folks um, and they are really good at providing assistance and helping you learn more about how to get a diagnosis, tips for talking to your family, tips for the caregiver, tips for the person living with dementia, a, a, a wonderful um, myriad of resources available from all of these organizations. And then on this next slide, um, some 
more general resources that aren't diagnosis specific. The first is in Georgia, we have our Aging and Disability Resource Connection, um, our ADRC, and, and not just for dementia, but for any issue for somebody who is older who has a disability this is a great first step to learn what resources are available to you locally um, whether that be in-home support services caregiver support groups home delivered meals um, a list of what facilities are in your area if you're thinking about having to make that move whatever it might be this is a really great first step to learn what's available in your area um, a lot of our these are based out of our area ages on aging a lot of them have additional resources and um, different trainings available or different case management services and so forth um, we are very lucky that we have um, the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiving here in Georgia um, this is a organization that supports across the country, across the world, but we have it here in Georgia. And so their website has a lot of information about their various programs, about the Care Nets, which are regional organizations um, that support caregivers. We also have Emory's Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Um, they've got a lot of good information. And as you heard from some of the folks in our diagnosis video, that they ended up going to Emory because Emory has folks that know about all the different types and can really help if you're struggling to to get that diagnosis. Obviously Emory isn't convenient to everyone across the state of Georgia since it is in Atlanta, but they do have some good resources on their website and um, that may be a, a drive worth taking if you're not finding the support that you need locally. And then the Dementia Spotlight Foundation, which is another nonprofit in Georgia that has a lot of really good information and support for people that are, are living with different types of dementia. So again, we wanted to share these for anybody who's experiencing some of those challenges and looking for some resources to help. And then we also just wanted to recognize with that video that there is a broad um, types of of challenges that people experiences. And throughout this webinar series, we're gonna talk about some ways that we can as individuals and as communities help support these individuals um, and, and recognize those challenges and still allow them to be um, important members of our communities despite those challenges. We have one more video we're going to watch, which discusses dealing with professionals, the good, the bad, the ugly. And so in this video, our care dyads talked about some of their experiences in professional settings. Ask more questions, you know, do more research. Don't always assume what you, you're typically diagnosing is actually the problem just be more more observant of the patient because of course he changed when he would go in for his visits there were some changes that you could just see so you know look at your patient as a person he'll tell you he's a king he has you know all these servants he has all these different things he has all this money and you know she continued to tell him what he didn't have which wasn't helping the problem whereas the neurologist that we later had was very helpful she let him believe what he needed to believe and get to get him to answer the questions she needed him to answer for her she listened to what he had to say she read his background to get an idea of what it was like before and where he's at now so that was very helpful for her i go to the doctor for a follow-up visit for some blood work that i had done i had a 10 30 appointment and i saw the doctor at five minutes after 12. with my dementia kicked in I started seeing colors, but when the doctor gets in to see me and a little bit after 12, I said, boy, that was a long wait. Then you know what he does? He gives me a lecture on how he has to do as a doctor that when people are sick, he has to take all the time that it's, he needs 
take care of them before he can see another patient. You know, I knew that. He didn't have to tell me that. I didn't think he was out cooling his heels somewhere. Uh, I knew he was busy. But see, he didn't understand. I knew his side of the story, that he was busy and helping people. But he didn't understand at all. He knows I have dementia. See, I wish he would take into consideration my illness. I know that I have problems, but it seems like a medical doctor, if I say, oh, my stomach hurts, they can deal with that. But if I say my head has gone electric, they don't have a clue. The only person that understands that is my neurologist. I can talk like that to her and she understands but if i go i've got a lung problem too uh i go to my lung doctor they ask me how i'm doing unless i'm just in bad pain i say i'm okay but i'm never really okay you've got to be in my head to know what it's like to live like i do we had a doctor that we visited in the spring and due to covid um they didn't want me to come in and I said, but he needs me to just in case he gets lost or he gets he can't answer a question that you have. And they were very um, they weren't very they weren't very happy about it. So they made me go sit down in the lobby. And because he it was over an hour, I I got worried. So I, I went back upstairs and then I demanded that they let me sit in the lob in their lobby. I mean, I was masked and they checked my temperature and all, but they did not, they did not want to allow it. And I was worried to death that he would be wandering all over the building, not being able to find his way out. The patient uh, feels uh, isolated when not being directly addressed about the patient's issues. And I think that is very, very important to speak directly with the patient and occasionally uh, uh, having some words with the, the person who's there with the patient, the support person, uh, so that uh, everybody's involved, hopefully, in the conversation. Directly address the patient so the patient feels like, oh, you really are talking to me <laughs> about my problem you know, rather than looking at the support person. And I think that that's, that's the better approach uh, when mm -hmm. dealing with uh, uh, patients who have issues, regardless of what they are. She uh, understands, she takes her time. It's not a 10 minute uh, doctor appointment, um, an hour, hour and a half, it takes whatever time I need. So uh, it's, it's very difficult with the behaviors uh, for people in the medical field to understand that because FTD is so misunderstood, even in the medical field. Uh, they, they say that primary care physicians see zero to two FTD patients in their entire career. And even a regular neurologist will only see five to 10 in their entire career. So it's, that's why it's so important to go somewhere where there is a cognitive neurologist who knows the other related dementias and uh, can do a proper diagnosis. Because otherwise, I am educating the medical community every time we go to a doctor other than uh, going where they know FTD. He was recently in the hospital with uh, pneumonia, and I had to educate everyone as to what to expect. And uh, I had to, I was able to go in with him uh, because I said, he has behavior variant FTD, and this is what can happen if you make me stay outside. When I went into the emergency room, if you make me stay in, outside, uh, please don't be calling me in two minutes. It, it's up to you then. And so they let me go into the emergency room and then they admitted him because he had pneumonia. And I stayed with him because 
you just can't be alone when you have any kind of dementia in the hospital. You cannot be alone. Uh, they, there's just not an understanding of dementia, and particularly frontotemporal dementia, which is different in so many ways. They expect him to not remember what to do. They, they, and in a hospital, you know, it takes a long time. A doctor might say, I'm going to get you X, Y, Z. And it may take a couple of hours before XYZ shows up. Well, there's no patience with frontotemporal dementia. And if I hadn't been there to keep the situation calm, we probably would have been kicked out of the hospital. Um, you know, in looking back, I really have got to say that uh, I was frustrated at some point uh, several times. Um, because I knew something was wrong and I was, nobody could say what it was. Um, you know, I, I ignored it for a while too. And I, you know, thinking that things were going to go away. The doctor did not ever look at me. He talked to Rick during the whole time. He, uh, it's like, and, yeah, and it just really, um, it really bothered me. And I even did, a, <clears throat> you know, a couple of times. And he didn't get it, and it, it, it really, really bothered me. I, I think just for them to be uh, understanding and compassionate uh, with with that person, because that person is a is a human being, much as they are, and to uh, give attention to that person, and, and Sandy didn't say directly that that's what she would like, but that's what she got. And so therefore that she is implying that that's what she would like to to tell the, the professional as well. And I agree. Oftentimes when she and I would go into one of the uh, visits with a neurologist or something, the neurologist acted like I wasn't even there, that I wasn't even there. So that in, I think is in contrast to a lot of folks' experience. So in closing, um, we've got a, a brief little slide that encompasses a few of the things that they said. I'm going to skip over this because I want to allow my board member, Dr. Jennifer Kraft Morgan, to share some other resources um, for professionals to provide um, better quality of care to individuals living with dementia and their care partners. But we will be sharing um, the recording of this as well as these slides on our website after the series is over. So I'll turn it over to her to finish us out. Hi everyone. I get to uh, represent the Guard Collaborative's Workforce Development Working Group and um, we are so excited to see these videos out um, in the in the community and um, in front of people to raise awareness about the lived experience, experience of dementia. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about a few resources that we have available that you um, might find useful. Um, we have a growing need for competent and committed healthcare workforce that can really deliver the quality and comprehensive person-centered care that all of these folks who are living with dementia and their care partners really need and that improving the education and training and developing the supports for these healthcare workers is vitally important um, to help them improve their skills and become dementia capable and culturally competent. Um, and we think that this high quality training and receptive organizational culture can really be uh, improve both the quality of the care, but also the quality of life for people with living with dementia. And I think you'll get to hear this more in the next a webinar about how people have learned to live more fully with dementia and that's really exciting. Next slide please. Um, the working group has done um, a lot of work. Uh, one thing that we've worked on is the um, guard competency guide and this is really for um, both employers and advocates who have loved ones who are in long-term services and supports to try to help um, educators and employers of direct care workers identify um, good quality content. Uh, it has training topics, it has skill statements, it has um, support for active learning so that, that employers 
and um, those who are advocating for people living with dementia can identify these trainings and make sure that direct care workers who uh, provide the majority of hands-on care in addition to informal care partners um, can get the training that they need. Next slide, Amanda. And then I just wanted to point you to resources that we've developed at the Culture Change Network of Georgia. Um, we have a playlist, next slide please, Amanda, um, on dementia, including Alzheimer's disease. We have quite a few little videos that are, you know, three to five minutes long that can help um, build awareness and help people understand more about dementia uh, in our communities. Next slide, please. Um, and what we think from the Ward Working Group is really that the, the main message here is listening to people with living with dementia and their care partners is vitally important. And if we listen, we can help to empower um, partners to meet the needs of people living with dementia, increase the competency, uh, the skills of direct care workers, um, help them successfully care for all clients, but particularly those with living with dementia, improve quality of care and quality of life, and really empower people to be their, their own advocates and to build the supports that we know we can have in Georgia to um, improve care and life. So thank you. I'm so excited that we're continuing this conversation all the way through October, and I'll turn it back over to Amanda. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, thank you all for spending your afternoon with us. I hope that you are planning to join us for some of the additional webinars, especially next week, where we will share the remaining videos and focus on a bit more of the positive side of things, as well as some ways that we might can help. So thank you again for sharing your afternoon with us, and I hope to see you again. Have a good day.